there's no ring rust on these guys right here. So Hell no. Um, yeah, no, we are we are uh, as, as fine two two podcasters as you're likely to come across. <laughs> And we're not giving you a money back guarantee on that statement. No. So. Well, all right. So I am. Uh, yeah, I mean, optimistic may be a stretch for Slasher season four, but mm -hmm. I think it can't help but be better than Slasher season three. Anything's better than than Slasher season two, yeah. which I found actually. There's a couple of movies that I watched between the Christmas and New Year time, which were absolutely dreadful, and I like I, I wasn't enjoying them, and I was getting about halfway through, and I was like, "This is awful," and I was like. Would I rather watch this or Slash for season three? The one I was like, eh, I'd watch this. So yeah, you're welcome. You know, <laughs> I think we, I think we had to experience that season. Yeah, to come out the other end. So I think that's I think you know to get to the the position where we can now reassess things we've already said are are universally terrible. Uh, it turns out there was a there was a whole different level. That we didn't know about <laughs> so. yeah it's true like i was i was watching uh a couple of movies uh, as well you know over the holidays assembling the top 10 list and that kind of thing mm -hmm. and that was just a treat because like even the worst of those <laughs> it's like so much better <laughs> yeah it was just like oh this is this is a delight i'll watch you know whatever like <laughs> Uh, escape room tournament of champions twice before I watch another yeah. episode of Slasher. I would, I, that's and that is like that is up there as one of my worst views this year. Well, last year was it's, the escape room yeah. sequel, and it's and hindsight is not you know it's bad, but it's not Slasher season three bad. Right, it's terminally stupid. Yes, and <laughs> and it also. It also has the added benefit of being like the dark middle chapter of a trilogy that you absolutely don't want. You're not getting a chapter three. There is yeah. absolutely no way they're doing a chapter three. I just can't believe someone at Sony's like that. You know what? Just listen, guys. Listen, guys. We've had all the success in the world with this Spider-Man thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's like, you know, one of the biggest grossing movies of all time and all the rest. Just saying we take some of that money, some of that money, that goodwill money that we got from audiences and Listen to me. Escape Room 3. Right. That's what... This is the pit. The, the trilogy that was always intended to yeah. actually reveal who the bad guys are is coming. And I, I just don't think that's a thing and I don't think it'll happen. But then what we've discovered, Bo, uh, in these last two years, <laughs> two years of, um, of uh, lockdowns and all the rest, is... Um, uh, bad things will find a way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Crap uh uh finds a way. Um so yeah, so you you never you never know. Um I'll tell I've you checked out your um I checked out your your top 10 list. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it wasn't horrendously wrong, so I'm Oh, well, thank you very problem. much. It's a couple that I was like that. Yes, Bo, that's right. And um you mentioned a movie which I had not seen this year. Uh, or last year, which was on Netflix, which I have now text, ticked off, and it has made my top 20, so... Wh which one was that? Uh, the Vigil. I hadn't seen Oh, The Vigil, the Vigil is real good. Had not seen it. Had That's not seen it. it. There are a couple of moments in that that made me shit my pants, like, just pure yeah. on... Like, like if, if I didn't know better, if someone had told me this originally started as, like, a J-horror production that had been converted over... You know, because there's there's something very grudgy about it, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Like specifically the, the, the nail trauma, which will get me every fucking time. Um, but there's a couple of like specifically the the way the ghost stuff works is very J horror. So um, yeah, I I had no expectations for it. It kind of blew me away. So I'm I'm glad you liked it. I I think that movie. Uh, the thing I like, and I I said this, you know, when I was talking about it on my top ten list. The thing I like about it is that the creature itself. Mm -hmm. reinforces the theme of that movie so well it's yeah. just it's so smart and so well yeah. put together and like i said the the fact that that guy is doing fire starter i'm like by oh, all means yeah right. let i bring it on i am very curious to see what he does with a reboot of that because the guy can clearly make a movie yeah and fire starter is one of those movies that i'd like in the the, the realms of king works i like that I don't necessarily, you know, it's, it, it's not, it doesn't hold any place in reverence that if someone was like that, going to remake it, I'd be like, yeah, go for it. Like, yeah. Please do. Uh, I can't wait to see an updated version of this. Um, mm -hmm. 
So yeah, so um, yeah, like I say, uh, not, not 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 terribly wrong, but uh, and so. Yeah, all right, I'm I'm <laughs> glad to hear that. I know that my number one, you you have not seen. So, uh, you know. Yes, I'm also one of those guys that would would annoy you. So, like, I'd, like even if I saw it and I watched it and I thought it was amazing, I would un, unlikely to put it on a on a list. I, Just yeah. the way my like the way my yeah. my like, the way my head works. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it on the list though. However, just you breaking it down the way you did has made me very curious. For it. And I'm going to make a Duncan guarantee right now. A Duncan guarantee, which everyone knows is worth its weight in shit. Uh, that a I will... Duncan T, they call it. <laughs> a Duncan T is what they call it. Um, that I'm going to have that all done for the end of the month. So uh, okay. I'm going to watch it. Uh, yeah, last last week of uh, January, where things are kind of freeing up. I will batter right through that um, but there's a couple of things in that like tv gets so good in january um because we have a uh, the next big thing which i'm excited for um is archive 81 i'm very what? curious about that as well yeah did you ever listen to the podcast I, so i was like not with any regularity yeah i don't know i was borderline obsessed with the first season of that podcast when it came out back in what it was like 2016 they came out in or around the same time that line town Started, which I still think Lime Tim's first season, anyway, is maybe the best audio drama that's ever been in podcast form. It's just like an amazing concept, great acting, and all the rest. But the actual ideas of Archive 81, the story of it, this idea of some, you know, archivist being sent to a place off the grid by a nefarious corporation who, you know, just would not like, act like would not give this guy any leeway he had to finish his job of archiving. And in the case of the podcast, it was audio format so it was tapes in the case of the adaptation for netflix it's you know video tapes which makes sense because mm -hmm. video format um and the idea of this cult being based in this building and this person essentially you're living through someone's views like two decades before of their investigation into it um i love that format and i was very 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 curious specifically when they attached james wan's name as a producer i was like oh no even though like I love Malignant, so it's going to score very high on my list, but I'm still like... Ugh. And then I saw the trailer and I was like, surprisingly, they've got a lot of it the way I would imagine it adapted. Um, and obviously it's a loose adaptation, so they're not going full in um, with it. But, it, you know, it, it looks like eight episodes. That to me seems like you could do that story in eight episodes. It, you know, it has, it has potential to be one of the better horror TV shows to, to make its way out there. And then I think the following week, Net, Netflix drops Ozark season four, part one. And I'm just like, oh, just like you didn't, watch. Let me, let I know me, you didn't like it. I know you didn't like it, but you didn't stick around with it. Let, let, me, let me throw uh, another one at you. Uh, uh, and that is Station Eleven. Which but is... I don't know Station Eleven. What's that? Uh, okay, so Station Eleven is... The uh, it's on HBO Max, I think, is where you can find this. All oh, right, and it is the story of <laughs> stop me if this sounds familiar of a <laughs> flu that mutates and kills almost everybody. So it's a post apocalyptic uh yep. story, yeah, but it weirdly revolves around this graphic novel that was written prior to the fall of civilization called station 11 all right that becomes a weird kind of if not holy text then certainly an influential piece of writing but also there were only two copies in existence oh, all right, and, right, and, right. and so there's a little bit of that it's just the way it's told and and mm -hmm. the the main character is a, a young girl named Kirsten who you see in flashbacks when the world is in the process of falling apart. Yeah. And also see in kind of, you know, the present day of the story, which is 20 years on. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and she works, not works, but she lives with a traveling group of actors and musicians who do a rotation around the Great Lakes that they call The Wheel, to go yep. to all these little communities and perform Shakespeare. Oh, excellent. And it's, it, it's so good. It is yeah. so good. Uh, it, and like the flashback episodes are kind of what you want. Cause every flashback episode that they do is like, okay, 
here's how this part of civilization fell apart. Oh, and and awesome. I, there's the the thing I love most about an apocalypse story is the moment where people realize like, oh fuck, this is not going like we're this is done. Yeah, yeah. And and there are several episodes that are just like there like there's one episode that's so good, man. I mean, slight spoilers for Station Eleven, but there's one episode where a bunch of people get dumped in this remote airport, mm -hmm. and. Like, all flights are canceled because everybody's like, everybody's fucking sick. Like, if, if somebody gets it, it's so transmissible. And the the thing that they say, you know, they, they don't go deep into, like, the science of the disease or anything. But they're like, the, the thing that makes this so dangerous is that there's no incubation time for this flu. Oh, like, right. like, like, you just, you get it and you're fucking dead in, like, a day. Yeah. And... um, So, there there's this group of people that find themselves at this, like like northern wisconsin or something airport that n they're all just stuck there mm -hmm. and and watching the news reports as they're like oh we're all fucked and like at one point like yeah. even the news anchor is like that's it folks i'm out of here and just takes yeah. off <laughs> and and they're like wait a second this is perfect because there is no reason for any major plane to land here yeah. We have food, we have shelter, we have heat, we have generators. Yeah, like you lock them. Yeah. We're kind of in a in the perfect spot for the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. And it's really interesting to see, like, oh yeah, I guess that's true. Like we're maybe we're okay. And all we gotta do is just not let anybody infected in, and then a few months from now everything's gonna be fine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and uh, obviously that it, it does not turn out to be the case, but <laughs> um, but it, it it's really interesting, like the world that they create of of you know there are uh, there's a distinction drawn between people who were born pre pandemic and people uh, who yeah. were born post pandemic and the world that they grew up in and mm -hmm. that kind of thing. It it really. Super well done. Mackenzie Davis, who was in like Halt and Catch Fire and was in that Terminator Dark oh, Fate. Yeah. She is Kirsten as an adult. Oh, uh, right. Excellent. Lori Petty is in it. And she's I terrific. I used to have the biggest crush on her. See, see her in Tank Girl about, like, honestly, I about yeah. lost my dick um, because of that. Like, yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, sure. She's, she's great in it. David Cross shows up for uh, a role it's yeah, i mean it, it really solid cast uh um, what's well, hbo hbo tend to be yeah you know they, they tend to be okay with that because they've got is it i'm trying to think is it them or showtime that has yellow jackets that, that I know showtime has about yellow well, jackets yeah which i'm hearing nothing but great things about as well but hbo had 30 coins which mm -hmm. i also still have to see and that's by alex d iglesias who i fucking adore and it's a bit it's about the 30 coins of the denari which um, it's the 30 pieces of silver given to Judas mm -hmm. and each is inhabited by uh, a, I believe a demon <laughs> and that was all it had to be said for me to go I need to get my hands on this but it didn't play in the UK so I think it's out there on, on the Blu-rays so I need to purchase that too much too much stuff Bo yeah, too much stuff. A hundred percent. Like I, I weirdly, I feel like, like caught up in my viewing right now. Yeah, and because uh, I'm not. Ooh, look at me, I'm all caught up. Right, like my top ten list is done. We all the yeah. Friedkin stuff got done. You mm -hmm. know, I've watched everything for like the upcoming A twenty four episode we're gonna do. Very uh, nice. I've got um, I've got one. I've got Lamb to watch actually, which is my last movie I need to watch before creating my list tomorrow, which I will record for release on Monday. Oh, so, Lamb Lam is a really interesting movie. I, I don't know. Hmm. I, you don't I don't know if it's a horror movie because I'm also hearing that as well. No, nah, it's not even that because I would say, yeah, it, it's more a horror movie. I'm not sure it's a good movie. Um, oh, right. I, I think interesting. It's, I think it's really interesting. Yeah. Um, But at the end of the day, I was like, so, so what about that? Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. like yeah, it, no, 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 I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah so I bet I'll be curious to hear your thoughts on it. I was a little cool on Lamb. Um, mm. I don't think it's I terrible, and and Numi Rapace is terrific in it, and it's terrific in everything. To right? Be fair. She's, yeah, she's you know, and I'm, it, yeah, I'm, I'm very, very interested, very, very curious. So, and it's also people like you know speaking Icelandic or whatever, and yeah. I I enjoy that. 
yeah, I, I'm, yeah, I, I, I've been, I've been to uh, Reykjavik. Um, that's where I went on my honeymoon. Uh, so I went. Um, we we split the honeymoon between Reykjavik and Paris. Um, so I spent a whole four days there during the time where you can see like the Northern Lights, um, and it's a it's a it's a beautiful like, like Iceland. Like everyone lives in one city, and that one city is on one place in Iceland. <laughs> it's mostly volcano, um, and uh, it's beautiful, it's an absolutely beautiful country. Yeah, expensive as fuck. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. Sure. So expensive, like so expensive, because there's not a lot of people there. So I'm kind of and to... and also you have to import everything because yeah, you know yeah, and like yeah. like you said, it's not that big a place. Uh, yeah. Uh, hey, so let's get to <laughs> hey. our our business uh, today. No way, no way to segue Iceland to Duran Duran. So we're just going to put a hard fast. Hey, yeah. Hey. You, why not? Uh, yeah. So uh, let me say this about the Seven and the Ragged Tiger, which is the yes. the album we are discussing today. We have done uh, the original self titled album. We've done mm -hmm. Rio, which mm -hmm. uh, Rio is a banger. Yeah. Um, I, the albums start off the way this one does. So. <laughs> man, Seven and the Ragged Tiger was one of the first vinyl records I ever had. Nice. You know, like when this came out, I was <laughs> young. Bo was <laughs> was ten years old when mm -hmm. Seven and the Ragged Tiger landed, which made me the perfect age for <laughs> a Duran Duran record like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and so I have a lot of fun. It's like I I know critically, um, it is considered not as good as Rio, and that's what probably the right. No, what the but, critics know though, Bo. Yeah, but they so, know that sitting in their comfy armchairs and their golden palaces, looking down their noses from their ivory towers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so you know, here's here's the way this works. If you're uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, mm -hmm. it we're we're having to cut out the music, and then over on the website and the Patreon, you will be able to see a an unedited version where we're going to chit chat through the songs themselves if you're listening to this on audio for the for the podcast or you're watching on youtube um we're just going to cut away as yeah. the song starts and then we'll come back and, and talk about it imagine it being like japanese porn um if you're if you're consuming this on youtube or in the podcast format this is the the segments we cut are, are like the blurred penises um, that you will experience if you ever watch Japanese porn. Uh, for those that are paying customers, though, that blur just disappears. Yeah. So, uh, well, you don't even have to pay. You can just go over to the website. I'm, I'm not trying to be too precious about this, but we just can't. You know, like it what's turns, that website again, Bo? Uh, that would be legionpodcasts.com, where you will be able to find a video version of this that is in its in its raw ass form. <laughs> raw yeah <laughs> uh so anywho <laughs> let let us let us get to uh, where did you find seven and the ragged tiger I, I told my you know the origin story of me coming to earth in my yeah. pod and <laughs> being raised by a kindly old couple with a copy of seven and the ragged tiger <laughs> i'm sure my my mum had a, a vinyl of like now that's what i call music um from whatever year and the reflex was on it, so yeah. that's that's how that's how I got. It might have been the first Duran Duran song I ever heard. Um, flex, and flex. Then found, yeah, flip, 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 dum, bum, bum. and then that bass kicks in, and you're just like, oh, yeah. No. Um, so yeah, like I I, I want to say that I actually had heard the album in its entirety, though probably mid nineties. Like I'd heard several songs from it, but not as a full thing. And that was generally at the point where I was. I'm not going through a, an experimental phase, but I was already listening to very much heavier music, but I played an instrument which wasn't necessarily uh, akin to heavier bands uh, playing playing keyboard. Um, bands like Duran Duran were just a bit more interesting. Um, so yeah, sure. it would have been probably a bit mid-90s, and I have a fondness for this album. It has been many years since I listened to it, so I'm very much looking forward to seeing how it plays back, but I, you know, I... I like yourself, so where this is not critically well received is is real, but I remember this one being like better musically written 
uh, than Rio. As in, like, the songs might not be the catchiest in the world, but musically speaking, this one's a step up, so. Dude, I'm just looking at the track list, I, you know, we're going mm -hmm. through all, all nine tracks. I'm looking at at least a third of the album I would yep. consider among my favorite Duran Duran songs. Yeah, yeah. So. This, is a, this is a short album. This is where they start cutting off a lot of the... The experimentation w waiting on the bus tracks where it's yeah yeah like this is like you can tell at this point they're like right we're in the business of making pop albums yeah so and uh, this is this is the first big because you got that in Rio you got but Rio felt like some for the label some for the band mm -hmm. still you know what I mean whereas the first album was a lot for the band yeah. um like by this point a lot of that you know some for the band stuff is just gone and a lot of this is well this is we're actually really good at this so. Let's just do this. And so. the first track is, of course, the Reflex Flex, and it that's, that's, is that's, that's, that's. it's the also the longest track on the album yep. at about five and a half minutes. And uh, so, so let's jump into it. On the count of yep. three, mm -hmm. the Reflex will begin. Three, <laughs> two, one, Flex Flex. <laughs> chorus, chorus. Seventeen choruses in this song. The um, that like because the standard pop writing formula, like to write a pop song, if you were if you were going by the book, right? If you, uh -huh. if you imagine there was a book that says this is how you write a pop song, pop songs nowadays are usually three and a half to four minutes long, and um, they usually have an introduction, mm -hmm. they have a verse, a chorus, a verse, a chorus, an interlude. The interlude section usually is whatever the intro was, so whatever the bit of music is there, but it's put in there with either singing or it's an instrumental bit or whatever and then you come back and you either do verse chorus out or you do back into the chorus and then a version of that intro as a way to feed out and that is it that is the if you were wanting to package it up put a stamp on it and say that's how you write a pop song that's how you do it and i love there was a time period in the 80s where they were just like can we have too many choruses no yeah yeah i mean like, like you said it's kind of like you know verse chorus verse chorus bridge yeah chorus you know yeah. whereas yeah like the reflex is like verse chorus 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 verse <laughs> chorus chorus, chorus <laughs> bridge <laughs> chorus 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 yeah uh, drum bit that goes dun, 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 chorus again but uh, <laughs> uh, you know i mean rocks. It, it 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 rocks it's a yeah. terrific terrific song it's meaningless but it it <laughs> it's great it's it's a great pop song and like like you know all the flicks flicks you know all that stuff is super fun <laughs> mm -hmm. um it's a song that you can easily remix which, which is, has been done yeah, yeah <laughs> which is great um yeah. i yeah i i mean and and also there's a part of him there's a part of him that knows him like you were talking about it during the 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 actual playing of the song like simon Le Bon knows that this is nonsense because the lyrics it leaves you with a question mark which is the last bit of the chorus mm -hmm. is that's him telling you that even he at that point is like eh. <laughs> i mean what is it who cares <laughs> yeah I, don't how about you don't worry about it how about you just yep. enjoy yourself um, it's just like him sitting there with wads of cash going yeah you always like here <laughs> Can you stop asking questions just have some money have the money I get pillied, but and, wads of cash bo <laughs> so and and in previous episodes as we've discussed duran duran we talked about how both musically and and fashion wise they kind yep. of came to represent the new romantic movement oh yes oh yeah, yeah, yeah. and I don't know that it gets any better than the next track for that. 100%. <laughs> you know, like they are they are considered like one of one of the first bands to really make that kind of new romantic switch and then there's like the decade is awash with bands that basically try and copy not only the image but the styles the sounds <laughs> put their own take on it uh, and whatnot. But yeah, you are right. Uh, New Moon on Monday is if you want to go back and find uh, like a genesis point of where it all just comes together and record labels are like this. <laughs> yeah. This is what we need as this song. <clears throat> um, and then from there, I mean, we're awash with bands. So. And and also, I mean like the the reflex is a hell of a way to start your record. Mm -hmm. And to back that up with New Moon on Monday, 
is yeah. I mean, like you've won. That that is a great record already. And that's a one two punch straight away. You know what I mean? For sure. And it's got uh speaking of bass lines, which we often do, the, the bass, bass on New Moon on Monday yeah. is maybe the best on the record. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's great. And uh so yeah, it's oh man, so good. All right, well let's uh let's uh light our torches and wave it for <laughs> the next song on the count of three. Three, two, one, Monday me. Here we go. Mm -hmm. You know, and even if it's not, you know, the most experimental, even if it's not the stuff like the first, <laughs> the whole second side of the first record or... Well, that's it, yeah. So, I mean, but th I think there's a time and a, like I say, there's a time and a place for that. And that's not to take anything away from what they're doing in terms of like writing music, but specifically what they're doing in terms of crafting a good, there's a difference. I, I speak about this a lot on the music reviews that I do for the music site that, you know, I, I contribute to that. There's a difference between a collection of songs and an album, mm -hmm. right? Like, like anyone, anyone, any musician anyway, can write a collection of songs, right? And, you know, I could I could parcel them all up together and call it an album, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a good album. Even if all the songs themselves are great songs, doesn't mean that it's a great album. The difference being that is an album is supposed to very much like a good mixtape is supposed to bring you in. You're supposed to you're supposed to load the front with something to catch the attention, take the listener on a journey, but hit those sweet points all the way through. And then generally the last song is, well, you know, that's that's been for you guys. <laughs> right, right, but right, right. This is us decompressing at the end. And that's like the, the craft, and I don't want to sound all old man McLeish here, but the craft of creating a good album is a lost art. It really is. And that's where I think specifically, that's the, one of the big jobs of a producer. The big job of a producer, obviously, is to get the song sounding as concise basically like an editor editing a film that's what a producer does he's not only recording it but at the same time he's saying it to the band no you need another chorus in that bit there or actually that's one chorus too much you simplify that bass line the best ones are the ones that help the band craft the best songs at the end but the best producers are the ones that are already with the band saying right this is your opening song this is your first single mm -hmm. this is where this goes this song's perfectly placed here this and some bands can walk in with that vision already and i'm not taking anything away from it but that's what producers like the best ones anyway do for a living is basically listen to everything and go like that well these three songs are not for the album because you know they're too disorientating or they're too samey or you know they go in a, in a direction that doesn't work this to me is the kind of first pure example in the Durant and you'll hear it again and again moving forward of where a producer is actually working in hands with the band saying like that right you, you know this is a great the, the reflex is bouncy it's uplifting it's jumpy that's your opening song but this is a banger and if reflex wasn't there this would be your opening song mm -hmm. for the album so let's put this in at number two and you have that like you say but you have them in at that point um, as a listener, I you know I, I'm so excited that I've just had two incredible pop songs by my favorite band. If you're a Jan, Duran Duran fan, um, and you you're eagerly waiting for that next song to come in, and that's that that's what I'm saying. It's a it's a kind of lost art. It's harder when you had the double sides. Um, it's harder like on vinyl to get that because you tend to find a lot of bands would load. A lot of junk on the B side, um, you know what I mean? Just a lot of that. Or, stuff or yeah, or Probably. like the, that first Duran Duran record. It's like first side is for the radio, second side's for us. You know, it's for us, which is once again, it's fine, it's fine. But you get a feeling that, and I think when the money starts coming in, when the lots of money start coming mm -hmm. in for a Duran Duran, and they see what's charting for them, there's a conscious choice to just like double down on the stuff that is really working for them um than the stuff that maybe is on the album but you're not playing it live or when you're playing it live people are going to the bar um 
you know, right. you like that's, there's that way of kind of bringing it in, and you get a lot of that here. You get a lot of opportunities where in the past, like specifically on New Moon on Monday, where I was saying to you, there's not a lot happening in this verse. It's very stripped back. It's bass mostly, it's drums uh, and synths playing a weird synthy marimba sound. Um, there's not really any guitars on there. In the past, what would have happened is the guitarist would be there playing something weird, or where there was a bit without synths, the synth player would be playing something, so they were all doing something. Mm-hmm. And that's not the way you write music. The best way to write music is to know when something is required and bring that in. And there are many more moments on this album where you can, you'll be sitting there going, this is a really cool bit, where does the awkward guitar bit come in, or the synth sound that I don't want to hear, or the weird vocal line which doesn't marry up with anything. And that's just not here this time. It's, it's, I don't know if that's the band pushing that or the producer pushing that, but it makes for a, I think, a more marketable album overall, just for listeners. Like, if you've never heard of Duran Duran before and you listen to the first two songs on this, you're buying the album. Yeah. And, and, I mean, you're, you're buying the album. <laughs> so, right. And New Moon on Monday, and I, I think every... I'll, I'll, keep an eye out for it, but I think every song on the record produced by Duran Duran along with Ian Little and Alex Sadkin. Yeah. Alex Sadkin um, would go on to produce like Thompson Twins. Yeah. He, he mixed the Talking Heads Speaking in Tongues record, which is yeah. <laughs> one of the great records of music history is mm-hmm. Talking Heads Speaking in Tongues. And yeah, so like these are people who know what the hell they're doing, mm-hmm. saying like we are going to make a pop record and yeah. we're going to make the best one we can. And so after two bangers, yes, of Reflex and New Moon on Monday, uh, now comes a their third track, uh, which is called <laughs> "I'm Looking for Cracks in the Pavement." Yeah, uh, I'm looking for being parenthetical uh, and whatnot. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, definitely kind of a different vibe than the first two songs, but still quite you're good. To do I that. think, yeah, you're allowed to do that. You've got the, you've given them their two big singles, your two big marketing singles at the beginning. You brought them in, like I say, it's like a mixtape. You don't just put all the best songs from. You don't do like a greatest hits. Like when you yeah. make a mixtape, you have to open strong. Those first two songs have to be to bring you in, and then you take the listener on a journey, which is exactly what Cracks in the Pavement is for. It was this was also the B side of Wild Boys. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you know. Anyway, so let us look for some cracks in the pavement on the count of three. Three, mm-hmm. two, one, crack. Like, to the point where he's like, what he's doing is just unreal. But look, this song is, it has, when you think of the structure, like, following the previous two songs, we played that chorus maybe, like, 30 times. Mm-hmm. There was two verses and just all choruses and a weird bit in the middle where we experimented with some guitars and synths. But that's about it. It's all chorus. And, it, you know, it, we've come off those two lofty highs. It's taken you down now. We've been brought down. Pace is slower than the previous two songs as well. Mm-hmm. So this is you, you know, you're now set on into the album, and that gives the band the opportunity to either go in the direction of a ballad, uh, stay where they are, do something around the same tempo, or pick things back up again. And that, as a listener, you're going through a journey with it. So yeah, I, again, having had the vinyl when I was a kid, like I, I'm looking for cracks in the pavement. Was kind of the like, okay, the, this is them saying like we're not just a you know, a pop song machine. Yes. This is a, a little bit of a, a slower kind of ballad sort of song. Yep. And, you know, I, I, like I said, not, not my favorite on the record by any stretch, but I, you know, I, some of these are for Duran Duran. Yeah. If you put cracks in the pavement at the end of that first album, though, it's better than the last three songs in the, the first album. Yeah, for sure. Cause so, it, you know it, I mean, that's what I'm saying. It's just the song where like they're still being experimental, but they're now doing it with the point of making pop songs. Whereas before they were being experimental because that's what they used to do. Um it's a different it's a different format, it's a different structure. And as a result, it is delivered in a, a better way. Like they, they could have went off for a four minute interlude section where everyone got a chance to do something weird um but they don't do that then interlude in that song was what less than 30 seconds long yeah. and then it played the chorus five times at the end so 
Um, so they've, they've, they've kind of got, they understand it. Like this one is not, this one's not going to sell lots of records. It's not going to be a single. Um, mm -hmm. We're not likely to be playing it much live if we ever do play it live, but that's fine. It's not a bad song either. So it's got a place in this album. The place in the album is to bring things down. Um, but Julie does that. Yeah, yeah. It, it definitely does. And they're also like, well, if we're going to do that, then mm -hmm. we've got to pick the tempo back up. 100%. And and that is where track four uh, comes in called mm -hmm. I Take the Dice. I take the dice, Bo, not you. I'm the one who dices. They <laughs> <laughs> see Bo is what they call him. And once again, here comes dumbass Ashy Larry. Uh, <laughs> right on time. It's the world championship of dice sketch. Um, this song... <laughs> <laughs> this song uh, has been compared to stuff that you will later hear when the Taylor boys decide to do a super group called Power Station. Yes. And this has a bit of that vibe of like, let's take the pop, but let's give it a little more of a rock and edge to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so once again, this is Duran Duran and Alex Sadkin and Ian Little uh, on the production side of things. And, you know, you're about to get a, a heap and helping of Andy Taylor uh, on, on guitar and yeah. John on bass. And uh, anyway, without further ado, uh, on the count of three, let's roll those dice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> three. And my segues are on point today. Three, two... <laughs> One, you know, let's do. And well, it's like that. I mean, that's about as that's the formula. You know I mean, it's what you've just heard there. Like, it, it it doesn't really go dramatically any like weird direction. It doesn't have to. Yeah. It's like we have a hook here. It's a really good hook. The chorus hook is awesome. Uh, and they built the song around that, and I love that. So, yeah, and I and I misrepresented that one. Of crime and passion is the the rocker on the back end because this was sort of like we have just gotten to the last track on side one. Yeah. So so like of crime and passion is where we're gonna flip the record. Uh, like this is the last song. Then we flip the record, and then you'll know what the what side two is because of w where it starts. Fucking but, union of the snake, dude. Like. <laughs> Motherfucking Union of the Snake, man. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. We'll we'll talk about that in a minute. But so I take the dice, you're right. Like it it does have, you know, as we were talking about during the, the song itself, it's it's really busy with a lot yeah. of like texture work. Yep. A lot of like weird like rolls of the keyboard or runs mm -hmm. of the keyboard and castanets and claps and stuff yeah, like a lot, that. A lot of weird percussion in the background. Just to, just to add and the way it's mixed as well is it, like some of it's panned left, some of it's mm -hmm. panned right. It's, to, it's, to, it's just to add texture to yeah. what they're doing. You strip that out as an incredibly basic song. And, yeah. um, and that works fine for it because once again, if you're taking the two big singles at the front and then we slowed things down, we're now getting all quirky and picking the pace back up. And then like you say of Crimes and Passion as a rock song to close out the first side, that, that tells a story. That takes you on a journey. The third song was the kind of bringing it down moment mm -hmm. and now we're building it back up to close the side off so it's good placement yeah it really good and uh i take the dice i also like all that like that percussive stuff you can yeah. easily argue okay well that is the representation of the titular dice being thrown. of course you of know? course <laughs> it's and, like actually like the, the went down that road like which yeah. i, I kind of like is it's like it's, it's just it's um it's very arty and yeah. that, that respect, you know, I mean, but, but, that's but it, in the it's, background well, it, so. it's their art sensibility married yep. with how do we make that art sensibility a pop song? Yes. Yes. And, and there's a, like we said before, they come from a prog background. That's what prog bands do. Yeah. <laughs> like probably you listen to Genesis used that a lot. Probably right. Back in the day, Genesis were like, you know, if we're going to mention an owl hooting, an owl has to be on this album. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Like on the first record, on the B side of the first record. Mm-hmm. This would have been like, how do we make the sound of clouds? You know, <laughs> and 
in this one, it's like, no, no, no. It's actually got to be interesting and exciting to listen to. And that's how you get I Take the Dice and not I yeah. Watch the, the Whales. Yes. Um, <laughs> and, th and then we get to Of Crime and Passion. This is the one. So sorry, uh, again, about misrepresented. Uh, of, of Crime and Passion is the one that was later compared to the Power Station stuff. And it's like, this is, this is where you see the roots of them being like, well, what if we turn the guitar up a little bit? Yeah, yeah. And funk bands, like in funk bands, the predominant instrument from the string section tends to be the bass. The guitars yeah. tend to be a bit thinner in the mix as well. But yeah, you get you get a bit of, not, not quite distortion, but you get a bit more oomph on this track. Yeah. And uh, so let's get both uh, criminal and passionate with uh, track five of Seven and the Ragged Tiger on the count of three, three, two, one. Play. It's just really well written. Like, I think that's the thing about it. Is like this is the this is an accomplished written song. Um, yeah. and it works. Like like you say, there we're not hammer. It doesn't have the greatest catchiest chorus in the world, so we're not resting on that as being the focal point of the song. That you know, this has all got. It's got peace. It's got groove. It's got rhythm, and that's at the forefront. Everything else is kind of there just to fill in the blanks, and that works really, really well for it. Plus, it sounds dramatically different from the f four songs that you've had before, which is a good thing to close out on on that yeah. side. You know, what I mean? because like you see, you you're now at that point where you're like, well, where do we go next? Um, and they they pick a conventional ballad. Uh, to go next is what they do. Yeah, they... uh, union of this. <laughs> All right, so there is some debate when we come to union of the snake. Mm -hmm. Is this about a cult? Is it about the 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 dark shadow of humanity that the snake itself is uh, our dark side taking over? Yep. Um. I thought it was just a, like a very fancy song title for what what they call in the industry docking. Yeah, so <laughs> docking. <laughs> the union of the snake is all about docking, as you know. It's all about docking. Yeah, yeah it's well, on Urban Dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> he all right. So Simon Lebon, mm -hmm. um, has has kind you know he. He is sort of notorious. No, no, notorious <laughs> nice. for thank you for <laughs> not not explicitly saying here is what this song is about. Yeah, I like that. And and so he's kind of cagely suggested that the song might be about tantric sex. Mm. That it might be about like the borderline of the song might be about the separation between the id and the conscious mind. Mm -hmm. um, like that, that Deckard was really a replicant. I understand. Bob. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever it is about, <laughs> it fucking rules. Oh, that's, this song is, yeah, there, there's a, there's a certain level of respect you have to have for a band to go here right now. In the middle of your album as well. And you're like that. Cause this could be a closing song on, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of Duran Duran in this. Like, a lot of them, and not, like, necessarily the, this is going to sell millions. Uh, which it did, by the way, because it was on an album that sold millions. But, uh, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm very excited. It's, it's been so long since I listened to Union of the Snake, so... Um, it was... I, I know it well. <laughs> yeah, and, it, like, it did well. Like, it, it, it made it all the way to number three on UK and US charts. Yep. And which is crazy because it's a fucking banana <laughs> song, <laughs> but it also like the Nick Rhodes keyboards are immaculate on Union mm -hmm. of the Snake. He does a great job. Like every, <laughs> obviously the bass, no no question about it. We'll get into it. But Union of the Snake is one of those songs that when I think of Duran Duran, mm -hmm. I think about how much I love Union of the Snake. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, might have been the reason, in fact, probably was the reason I bought the album, mm, was nice. Union of the Snake. Um, and mostly the video, which is some weird, like, road warrior thing with... Oh, it's just bonkers. Yeah. yeah, I mean, if you've never seen the video for Union of the Snake, it is only surpassed by potentially wild boys. Yeah. 
<laughs> in the entire history of Duran Duran music videos. Hungry Like the Wolf is good because it's horny. Yeah. As is the song. But Wild Boys and Union of the Snake are kind of a, a two-for video one-two punch. Of yeah. like, this is the most 80s shit, and it, it's why that... It's why people are nostalgic for the 80s. Because it's so bonkers yeah. and weird and artsy and all of that stuff. Mm-hmm. All right. You ready to snake it up? I am ready to unionize, Bo. We're <laughs> yeah. going on straight tomorrow. <laughs> all the snakes taken to the streets, allowing no snake scabs to cross that picket line. <laughs> Just... <laughs> I, I like uh, the the Bernie Sanders snake that just look on a chair. <laughs> the one it's percent. It's it's, it's it's sitting on a chair with a little beanie hat with an anorak which is kind of wrapped around it and a little glove on its end of its tail. Yeah, <laughs> we're here trying to get justice for yeah, the one, for the ninety percent. <laughs> All right, enough Bernie Sanders snake jokes. <laughs> Let's uh... did not did not know where we're going there. I love it. <laughs> love every second of it. All right, on the count of three, let's union of the snake. Three, two, one, play. I would petition. <laughs> well, once again, like you said before, like this, most of these songs on this album, there's only two songs that go over five minutes, and it's the opening and closing songs. The rest of them are pop length, which is kind of crazy, man. Because Union of the Snake does not feel like a pop song to me. I mean, that's how no. it's structured. Yeah, but you know, like we talked about the the music break in the middle of that, where it's just like, okay, let's just get a bass line going. Mm -hmm. Let's mm -hmm. riff with the guitar for a second. Let's let the saxophone and the keyboards go nuts for a second. Mm -hmm. And all of that feels very experimental. But again, it's filtered through that prism now of they know how to put together a pop record. So they're like, well, what if we did it? But it was interesting, you know, and yeah. not just, <laughs> yeah. and, and not just not, weird not, flights of fancy. Yeah, you're not, you're not compromising your... You're not compromising your sound. All you're doing is making it fit within a new context. You know, a new a new paradigm. Your new paradigm is pop songs are not five minutes long, even though like we've said the reflex is, but you know, most of them aren't. And as a result of that, it's kind of, you know, at that point, you can go a bit aloof, you can go a bit Duran Duran, but if you make it 45 seconds or a minute instead of three minutes, you can still get that in there. And I feel that there's uh, to me, it's just smarter songwriting mm. because once again, before, like we said, like live, most likely that will be extended out. You can go weird and trippy with it because that's where you can do that. On the album, you might want to just keep it a bit more contained to give people a a taster. Like you're listening to that, I'm listening to that, like that. I wish that section was longer. Mm. You kind of want to be like that if you're like if you're writing music, you want people to be saying, I wish that section was longer. You never really want to be saying, I wish that section was shorter. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? How, so, how do I make this song not happen <laughs> as much? How do, I make, how do I make this song end? Oh, I can skip, uh, which is easier now in a digital domain, but back then... You're right, I gotta go easy. over, I gotta, I gotta lift the needle, I gotta move it yeah. over, I gotta get it on yeah. the right groove. Oh, yeah. shit, I scratched my record. Yeah. The uh, world is ruined. Yeah, uh, took some weeks' wages to just buy that one. You know what I mean? It's all those things. So, I I, I get that now. Like at this stage, they're still they haven't compromised anything. They're just being smarter on how they're doing it. Yeah, and but it's such a weird, it's weird. like the chorus itself. <laughs> it's, the union it's of so the weird. snake is on the rise, and you're like, what the, the fuck? Or, like, do I need to be worried about this? I mean, are yeah, they are they coming uh, for me? <laughs> <laughs> and the headlines at this hour the union of the snake is on the rise uh, yeah. a spokesperson for, for for union of the snake said this was serious um so we need to watch what we're doing Bo. we need to watch what we're doing all right oh man oh i mean we could just stop right here because union of the snake is my god i feel like i need to clean my drawers um <laughs> <laughs> But we come to a song, Duncan. Yes. That uh, pro bass player John Taylor 
was not a good enough bass pay- player to record when the band first formed. Yes. That this, uh, be- all right, before the, the year of our Lord, 2011, <laughs> um, shadows on your side was the oldest song recorded in Duran Duran history. Like it was yeah. re- as, as far as the age of the original song being written, not yes. performed. Yeah, yeah. And so John Taylor, when they they first formed, basically said, I can't play that bass line. Yeah. <laughs> Which is crazy because he can play anything. Mm-hmm. And then uh, by this point uh, in the seven in the Ragged Tiger years, John Taylor was like, oh, I can do that shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and according to John Taylor himself, he has said that this song is about the darker side of fame that they were living through at the time. Yeah. And uh, so the song, of course, is called uh, Shadows on Your Side. It is coming on the heels of Union of the Snake. (laughs) Which, man, just a tough road to hoe. Like, no matter... (laughs) You basically have to follow this up with Hey Jude. Yeah. You know, it's like that get back documentary or something where yeah. like yeah, Paul yeah. McCartney writes like the long and winding road and get back within 10 minutes of one another or whatever. Yeah. And you're like, he's in the groove. What the fuck? He's what in a- the groove. <laughs> oh man. Have you watched that? I've seen clips. I've still to watch it all. You should watch it. It's so good. I would, I would so love it. I, yeah, I would like. I, I love things about, I'm not the biggest Beatles fan. Sure. Um, but I, I love I love documentaries which explore how musicians create music. You know what I mean? Like, even yeah. if I don't love the outcome of that, I like I am I'm one of these people that appreciates the craft. Like having been in bands before, um, and being around like loads of musicians, very, very, very talented musicians. Um, I've been in rooms where you spend three hours and you come out at the end of that with nothing. Yeah. <laughs> like you like you come out with like an idea which you thought was great and then one week later it's the worst you know, it just doesn't go anywhere and ends up in a but so to see someone the clip I saw was I'm doing uh, I've seen a couple of clips but the, I think the one is uh, I'm doing get back and just you just see him yeah like just pull it out of his arse uh, yeah, when he's nuts. just doodling he's like there's something here and so yeah he's, uh, and then but the the, the 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 bit that always kind of floors me is like like John Lennon's late mm-hmm and he just comes in and sits down there, and he's just in the he's just in sync with him straight away. He just yeah. picks up and just like right into it. It's a different level. It's a, di- it's a different level of musicianship where, like, as a band, you're just all bands don't always get in sync that way. You know, where everyone's just you can be away for a couple hours, you come back and you you know exactly where that person is, or you can pick up and go straight into it with your own because he's not just playing. That's the thing about that. Like Lennon doesn't come back and just play what Paul McCartney's playing. Yeah, the, the, the he understands of, what chords are being played, and he plays his own thing over the top of it, which is just like, like just straight away. <laughs> my 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 two favorite things about that whole documentary: one is you, just what you're talking about, like you get such a sense that Paul McCartney and John Lennon were soulmates. Yeah, you yeah. know that they just they understood each other. They despite whatever all the rumors about like their bickering and that kind of thing when it came to them playing music together they they had a simpatico that is only rivaled with ours yeah yeah you show me any two artists that never have disputes about their art then i will be floored yeah especially everyone has like otherwise what you doing like you kind of have to have a but like you see, when it comes to the end product, the songs that they write, I mean, that's where the magic happens. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it's on the, uh, I have it. I have the documentary. I just not watched it yet. The the so. other thing that I took away from that is how painfully polite British police are, because oh, the, they are. Well, the, they were. like the whole back end of the documentary, <laughs> like that most of that third episode is them doing the rooftop concert. Yeah. And watching this video of the police being like, so uh, we have told you that you should stop all of that noise on the roof. Is yeah. anyone going to do that? No? Hmm. Let me call my manager. And it's, uh, it's, it's yeah, that I, kind of thing yeah. where you're like, nobody is storming the roof. And even when they go up there, they're just like, so will they be stopping soon? No? Hmm. Would you <laughs> please stop soon? It is yeah. so funny. <laughs> 
a different time, though. It's a different time. Although in saying that, they're not that bad now either. I know some people would disagree, but uh, any interactions I've ever had with police, and I'm yeah. not saying that because there's a policeman that lives next door to me, any, any interactions I've ever had with the police, they've always been, as long as you're not a dick to them, they're fine. Like, they're, they're very polite, very courteous. Um, so... Yeah, that, that is a cultural difference, Duncan. Uh, yes, uh, well, they don't carry guns over here, though. Just for like things like, oh, like, someone's playing music too loud. The police don't shop with guns in the UK, right? right. There's the difference, you know. What I mean, a SWAT team doesn't bust in. I mean, like, <laughs> you know, like, like they, they don't they don't walk the streets carrying guns in the yeah. UK. So it's only at it's only at like uh, places like airports or when like protecting like Parliament and stuff. Are they actually armed in that way? So I think that also makes them a bit more, they have to rely on being able to talk to someone as opposed to beating the shit out of them. Um, Interesting. Eh, yeah, well, you weird. know, to each their own, I guess. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's why your prisons aren't Phil Duncan. Ours are. <laughs> right. <so. laughs> yeah. How are you supposed to fill all those prisons then? Um <laughs> Prisons aren't going to fill themselves, Duncan. They're not going to fill themselves, Bo. We've dropped the ball on that. Um, anyway, let's get to the song that John Taylor said was too tough for him to play. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is Shadows on Your Side. Let's begin on the count of three. <laughs> three, two, one, play. The album? Do you know what I mean? Right, well, I mean, again, you're coming off of Union of the Snake, and so, like... <laughs> it's normalized a lot, is what you're saying. <laughs> right, you can get weird with it, and it sounds like, you know, something perfectly natural. Yeah. Uh, but, yeah, it does It does feel like old Duran Duran to me. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. you're right, it's modernized, and, and they've, they've kind of reined in a lot of their impulses to make this song go on for seven minutes. Plus, they're better. They're more like not even just on a bass level. They're more accomplished musicians. Like Simon Le Bon is clearly a more comfortable and confident vocalist at that point. Whereas, like, th there's no bit in there. Like, once again, that first album and no shots fired against it. There are a couple of moments we mentioned at the time where we're like, oh. uh, like he was yeah, singing yeah. out, and I was like, I don't know if that necessarily works. At this point here, it feels like he's got his range, he's got his register, he knows what he's doing. This is not a Le Bon song, right? You know what I mean? This is predominantly everyone else in the band doing stuff, which is what gives it that old Duran Duran feel because the first album was predominantly songs written before Le Bon came in. It was them carrying stuff over from the prog days and Le Bon doing what Le Bon does over the top. So, you know, I, I, I get that. However, the production on it, uh, the length of it, for sure, four minutes is, you know, that's cut down compared to some of the old stuff. It feels like that song was written, but what they've done is, if it, we're going to put on this album, he can play the bass line on it now, and let's let's rework it for the album, and that's what you get at the end, so. Yeah. Uh, again, I, I think Shadows on Your Side is a perfectly fine song. Yes. But, again, you're coming off of the heels of You Need of the Snake, which is just one of my favorite Duran Duran songs yep. of all time. So what are you gonna do? Um, the me the metal analogy for that is any band that goes on after Slayer, right? <laughs> yeah, it's like you're fucked. Like you don't want you don't want to be the band after Slayer. You don't want to be the band before Slayer because all the fans do is shout Slayer during mm -hmm. your set. You don't want to be the band after Slayer because all the fans do is shout Slayer during your set. Um, so you know it's the Kobayashi Maru of positions on a on a. On a, on a bill uh but yeah i mean it works for, once again you've got union and snake bonkers crazy out there fun engaging different you take it down and mm -hmm. then you return with some tiger tiger so it's all about play the it, placement is important on this album and tiger tiger the instrumental of the record speaking of yep. getting weird yes. um but yeah i kind of dig the fact that i like it when a band is just like you know what we're this is just us noodling around and we think this is a good composition a vocalist doesn't need to be on every single song on an album. Yeah. Like especially especially if it is a band. Yeah. That's the thing. Like I, I understand that like pop albums, but it's all pre you know, the modern day pop albums, it's all pre-made in like a studio with a producer. I understand why every single song needs to have you know a vocalist on it, because that's the selling point. But if you're Duran Duran, first and foremost a band, but also a pop band with really talented musicians. The vocalist doesn't need to be on everything. And also, if you're going to do that, you do it as the second to last song. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. This is, the perfect again, placement. 
right we're putting this on the back end this isn't what we're ending the album on but yep. this is a thing that we we really like yes. and uh so without further ado on the count of three three two one burn bright Uh, not that far off. But again, I like. I don't think that's gonna set the world on fire. I think it's cool. I think it's a good it's really piece well of written. music. Really well written. Like yeah. all that works, and it's not too. But uh, like an instrumental with this band, it could go off the wall. It could go kind of crazy. <laughs> and they haven't. They haven't done that. They just crafted a really, really good instrumental song. So. Right. It's just like this is. Um, I almost want to say like it's the thing where as the the album is wrapping up, yeah, um, that you're kind of just getting into the groove of like, yeah, you know, like the, let, let's just kind of enjoy these moments, these final moments we have together, kind of thing. <laughs> of like, we're just gonna show off a little bit that we're not just the pop band of the of the first side or even of like yeah. uni of the snake or, or, or something that you know that we can craft a piece of music that is uh, you know kind of beautiful and i think tiger tiger is i think it's a very pretty yep. piece of music mm -hmm. i agree bo ramsdell i agree but you've got to ask yourself this question we have five minutes 20 seconds left of the final song the seventh stranger yes O originally, Which means you've already you've already met sex strangers. That's a weird day. The, all right. So originally, the name of this song was Seven and the Ragged Tiger. Yes. Which was changed to the Seventh Stranger, um, and so uh, you know the the album retained the name of Seven and the Ragged Tiger. The song did not. Yes. Um, Simon Le Bon states, Duncan, this song was mm -hmm. inspired by Candide by Voltaire. And uh, also the the concept of Ronin, and oh. the and the movie The Seventh Samurai, that those were all inspirations for this song. He is just going all over the place. Yeah, <laughs> that that is a that is a weekend of drugs, literature, and great films. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and uh, also a quick note about the bass that is being played in this. John Taylor oh. plays a fretless bass. I do love a fretless bass because you can tell the difference. Yeah, so... Um, a lot more sliding. You hear a lot more sliding techniques in a fretless bass. Smooth. Yeah. And and so, uh, again, th this song is very much... And it's a good song to end the album on because it's all about, like, wandering alone and and uh, sort of being faceless and, and nameless uh, as you, you move through the world. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know... For uh, r rumors in the wake of such a lonely road, trading in my shelter for danger, you know, uh, are lyrics that you will find in this song. And I, I, I think it's a, it is a cool song to end the album on. A hundred percent. Like, let me just put it this way. The picture that you have of Duran Duran behind you as your background just now, they look like characters from an anime. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, you know, I love it. I kind of love it. Uh, they all look like, I particularly like, like look, look at this guy here. Yeah. <laughs> they all look like they could be um, maybe yeah. the best samurais ever to walk the wasteland. <laughs> the, the, this happy yeah. little fella. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah I, I, I really like this background. Um, all right. Well, let's <laughs> let Seventh Stranger it up on the count of seven. No, no, no. Yeah. On the count of three. <laughs> three, two, one, seven. Here we go. And I think particularly coming off of something like Tiger Tiger, where it's like, we're just going to show you that we're good musicians. Well, this is this is what I'm talking about. Song placement. You've got them constructing an entire song without the vocals. And then the next song is all the instrumentations playing pretty much all the way through it with the vocals over the top of it. It's just good songwriting. You know, it's good. It's good placement on the album you have that going in there and thematically speaking from a musical point of view um it makes sense to jump what well, wouldn't it made sense if we jumped into the next song and it was just the keyboard and the vocals or you yeah. know like and that to me is not satisfying everyone's kind of 
we've had the musicians song just before it and now we're slipping into the musicians all playing all the way through with the vocals on top so it's building back into it yeah it's yeah i mean it's a a really smart satisfying way to end the record yes um yeah, yeah. you know again it's not like you're not ending the record with like well that's going to be a number one hit it, yeah it, it's more like well you, that's going to end the record in a way that you're like man that was seven and the rack of tigers good shit um yeah. you know we should we should probably turn this back over to the a side and listen to the reflex again yeah um, would, you, would you you can feel yourself doing that as well because it ends at such a deliberately slow piece as well that when you think of the reflex it's, flex, it's yeah. Like, yeah yeah <laughs> As um, you know, as as it picks you back up. So if you are switching back over, you're then hitting a stride again with it. So mm -hmm. yeah, this is what this, to me. This is the first. This is the first pop album from Duran Duran in terms of it doesn't just have like a smattering of pop songs in there, uh, and then like eight minute opuses and you know in the middle and whatnot this is a, this is an album where no song really goes uh, that far removed from pop song length but can still be you know in parts a very musician driven song um or at other times something which whilst maybe not having the hooks of other ones is still predominantly based around the idea or concept of we need to keep hitting this chorus if this chorus is catchy if it isn't then we need to keep hitting all the weird instrumentation that we do in the middle to make it sound more interesting and there's a there's a kind of almost like a trade-off you never get two on the same song so you never get a song which is really busy with all the instrumentation with a really 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 hooky chorus that we need to play a lot of where in the past I felt they tried to do that um and this one it's almost like a trade-off between the two uh which is smart it's smart I mean, yeah. you get the best of both worlds that way you get the songs that are going to sell millions you also get the songs that you really are maybe a bit more invested in without like weird lyrics like the reflex or you're on the new moon on monday where the lyrics don't necessarily don't necessarily spell a narrative story which is appealing to anyone who's like reading the liner notes and going what the fuck does that mean um so you get that trade-off between the two. You can be more vocally meaningful on the tracks that are more interesting musically and more vocally aloof on the tracks that are more appealing to listen to yeah. if you're a, a, your average pop fan. So it's, it's a fine balance. And I think they hit it here. It's not, it doesn't have, it's not wall-to-wall -wall the best, you know, songs that Duran Duran have ever done, but this is them... Make it if you're following the transition from the albums. This is the first one where I think they get it as an album. This is what an album should sound like. Like there's no one song in here like that that you know is that should not be on this album. The previous two albums there was at least one song where I was like, why is this on this album? Um, they, they all sound it's all it's all lined up. This is an album, and from this point they will continue at you know at great speed, and you will hear it as we go through them. Where the once they get that bit nailed in, it, it gets a lot more interesting to listen to them um, because they will give you amazing singles yet to come, but they will give you tracks which are kind of primo quality musicianship of Duran Duran and a bit more thought provoking, but not at the expense of the flow of the album, which mm -hmm. is an issue before. Yeah, I yeah, I think seven and I, I totally agree. I think seven and the Ragged Tiger feels like the first complete thought of a record mm -hmm. and yeah and it's terrific it's a great record yeah um you know maybe of the three that we've done so far probably the best maybe not the best single song on mm -hmm. on the record but in terms of just being a consistent enjoyable listening experience uh i think it, it's it's pretty great um yeah i like this one a lot um yeah all right, well, speaking of things that we won't like, <laughs> we'll be back in two weeks, Duncan, uh, to uh, start At least our... we get Cronenberg right at yeah. the start. We're getting Cronenberg straight away, and like, regardless if the rest is shitty, we're opening with Cronenberg. If it goes to yeah. shit after that, we, we can reminisce about how great Cronenberg was. In it. Yes, so we will be... We will be tackling Slasher Season 4, and then looking past that... Yep. Uh, it is your pick. I can't wait. I actually physically cannot. Like, one of them was on the TV over here over Christmas. Um, and I watched it and I was, I, 
very close to wetting myself with laughter about three or four times. Like there's there's something about um the work on the Pink Panther movies and Peter Sellers' performances in them that will Sellers and Herbert Lawn on the screen at the same time is like it's as as hardwired to my funny bone. So I, I actually cannot because it's just gonna be full of our bad impressions. So I can't wait. <laughs> yes. So uh to <laughs> clarify what Duncan was saying there we are going to be doing after slasher season four mm -hmm. we will be uh doing the entire run of pink panther movies and that includes the steve martin ones as well yeah. for anyone out there that's like well that's good because i'm not covering those steve martin ones oh no we're doing the we'll, we're doing we'll the do steve it martin ones. Yeah. uh oh and i should tell you by the way i finally finished uh only murders in the building which was that last episode you're right was hilarious the, it's tough, like see what see, <laughs> there's a bit like there's a bit where like he thinks he's standing yes, up and yes. doing, <laughs> doing the, like the yes we cracked the case and I got you and then you see him drunk and I think he's like and the, and the, and like that I about pissed my pants man honestly yeah. so like it's, 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 an, it's a brilliant TV show it's very that's sick I think it's the sixth episode which was the one that has no dialogue until the very end yeah, was exactly. like just a, a great piece of television filmmaking. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But that yeah. last episode, it, because all season you're like, it, it's funny though. I mean, yes. the whole run is funny, but seeing Steve Martin get to do that kind of very silly kind yeah. of comedy that, <laughs> yeah. you know, was more of like the jerk era, Steve Martin, where yeah. it's almost a callback to that of just like, he gets to do this like drugged voice yeah. where he thinks, like you said, he very confidently thinks he's, that he's he having is, his Columbo moment. Yeah. You know I mean, he's having his eye practice. His Brazos. Like, you could, like, that. Yeah. Yeah, his Brazos moment where he's, he's all standing up and everything's about him. And then you cut to what's actually happening is, is he stroke of fucking genius. And that's a great TV show. Like, I, yeah. like we, we watched it. We went through it pretty quick and, I, I was that way when I was like straight online and it's been greenlit for the season two. So I'm, yeah. I'm so happy about it. And they could just, anything with Martin Short and, you know, uh, Steve Martin and it has me, it has my attention anyway. But the fact that they're, they're still just as funny now, mm -hmm. it kind of warms my heart a little bit. Because there's always that thing where you don't want to see people past their prime. Yeah. Um, trying to do the stuff that, they're, and they're just, like Martin Short is the MVP of that. He is fucking hilarious all the way through it did um so, all right yeah. so a few years ago if i've told you this story before i apologize but um probably five six years ago at this point somewhere in that neighborhood um i went to florida uh to visit my buddy chad and while i was mm -hmm. there i saw steve martin and martin short live oh uh, no you didn't tell me this so you know was they were he, was, was was he doing music or comedy steve martin they, they did a little of everything because it was both of them together paul schaefer was there was there as Jesus well God. as their musical <laughs> accompaniment and uh so it was them kind of doing their shtick of like if you've seen the netflix special that they did together it's basically yeah. that that show is what i saw yeah, yeah, yeah. there is a bit man and it's among the funniest things i've ever seen in my life <laughs> Where uh, Martin Short, uh, uh, Steve Martin is on stage. There's another guy that comes out that's kind of a big brawny dude. He comes mm -hmm. out from one side of the stage. Martin Short comes out on the other. And the, the mm -hmm. brawny dude is wearing a kilt. Right. He comes to center stage. While Steve Martin is just watching as if to be the, the expression of the audience of like, the fuck is going on here? Yeah. Martin Short is in this weird bodysuit where like this kind of gray, almost flesh color bodysuit so that he looks almost naked with like mm -hmm. nipples drawn on it and stuff. <laughs> it's super weird. And he, they meet in the middle of the stage. He and this brawny guy in a kilt. Martin Short jumps into this guy's arms, sticks two of his fingers in this guy's mouth, and then proceeds to do a bagpipe impression. <laughs> Where he's like, hur, hur, hur. <laughs> does this bagpipe impression. When he's done, he hops out of the guy's arms, both of them bow and retreat to the wings. Genius. The audience is crying. Yeah. And Steve Martin looks at the audience and says, I'm so disappointed in all of you for laughing. <laughs> <laughs> 
and it was one of those moments of like pure <laughs> comedy where like you said it it wasn't just them like recycling shit it was like yeah they are still it's so funny like still hilariously funny yeah yeah and I, I, I know a lot of people out there know steve martin for like obviously his comedies through the you know 70s 80s 90s um but like, there's a reason you don't see it like it's because like the brazos character talks about being able to pick up any musical instrument and play that is him in real life yeah like his banjo stuff is mind blowing like mind blowing in yeah, terms he's, of he's a grand a, master uh or yeah. like whatever the high end of like yeah, yeah he's profession. like just an incredibly talented individual just in general and that show can do like I hope they go bonkers with it in the next season. I genuinely do because the 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 sillier moments were the bits that just gave me like the the biggest smile. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, um, and this is the positive effect. Just like as a kind of closing note, yeah, it's the positive effect. I think of Knives Out. Yeah, I think this. Like, I think post Knives Out, you don't get like a show like that. I think there's a now a kind of recapturing of the the murder mystery that I'm really excited for because that's what I grew up watching. So I kind of long form TV show about three avid, and it helps that it was about true crime podcasts and that's all I listened to. Yeah. And yeah, it just, it just hit me just right. So uh, yeah. I'm glad that you're Yeah. Yeah. It. Very, very funny. Very, I, again, it's just nice to see those guys being hilarious still. And, yeah. and, and the show itself is really smart about kind of skewering, you know, true crime crime podcasts and how they're produced and like tina fey's character is really funny yeah. and dead yeah. on and we, we were the thing is as well like right to about the very close to the end we were still guessing who the killer was which yeah. like generally with these sort of things i can pick the killer out pretty quick <laughs> like like you you maybe heard me we'll talk about slasher um <laughs> right. i'm usually on i'm usually on the ball with oh well that that's the killer and it, it genuinely had a really good mystery at its core so uh all right well you want to uh give a, a a quick shout out to where people can find you before we we wrap this up here i will do indeed yeah podcast under the stairs this week and check out the stuff i'm doing at the moment i am closing out the brand new season of dexter which very much worth your time it has been absolutely incredible um and that's like one of those stories where like i've got one episode to watch and it could all come apart in that last episode so hopefully it won't um so there's a bit of that my top 20 of 2021 will be dropping probably just before this drops so you can go and check that out uh bo joined me recently to discuss gone girl and opera omnia so that's in the teapots collective feed uh we've got one more movie to do and that's us finished with fincher uh, so we'll be doing mank next closing out that season um and yeah so there's loads of things happening 2022 is going to be a huge year for content for me so please check out the easiest way to do it on any podcatcher either podcast under the stairs or teapots collective or even easier than that teapotscast.com which is where all the shows are fantastic uh i had to look behind me real quick make sure that the <laughs> the dog was not about to assault me i thought you were concerned that simon Le bon was gonna get you no 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 i i, I think johnson just farted um, <laughs> woke himself up with his own stench <laughs> <laughs> that's kind of what he does he just just sleeps and farts um i i think maybe i got a broken dog um he's a total sweetheart like i love him to death he's he's yep. a, a great uh like cuddle companion but mm -hmm. dog will drive you out of a room in a hurry <laughs> it's like 50 pounds of stink um <laughs> Anyway, uh, you can find more of my stuff at uh, The Dark Parade, which is a, a horror podcast that looks at uh, all kinds of horror movies, as well as uh, uh, bonus episodes that uh, look at things like, you know, romance and horror movies with Kay Pollock, uh, mm -hmm. a bonus episode called The Heart of Horror uh, is where we do that. And also uh, Found Footage Fool, which is me trying to figure out why I still watch found footage movies but use uh, as five criteria to scientifically determine if these movies are successful or not. Have you seen the curse of Zardo uh, Professor uh, the no. curse of Professor Zardonicus yet? No. Uh, put that one on your list. I, yeah. I mean, it's, it doesn't necessarily succeed in being scary, but the performances are great. So that's from this And year. that's found footage? Okay. 
that's film footage, yeah. It's okay. like a college documentary. Um, what's it, disguised as a college documentary, but the person that we are following through it uh, is a really, really, really good actor. I, 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 he genuinely commits to the performance. So, okay. Uh, the Curse of Professor Zardonicus, not Sardonicus, as in the William Castle movie. All right. I will, uh, I'll, I'll check that out. I may watch that today, as a matter of fact. Um, there you go. All right, and uh, and of course you can find that and more over at legionpodcasts.com uh, where you can get all kinds of uh, uh, podcasts from me and others. Uh, turns out last month was the biggest month we ever had, which was strange because uh, like, normally it's in October where the, the numbers spike because of Halloween and whatnot, and December was I, crazy. I think people just... I think that the, the fact that Christmas is starting earlier for everyone now, I think people just push themselves into horror <laughs> and other content i think so apparently so but we appreciate it uh over there that you know i i like seeing five figures in a month that's always nice uh <laughs> so at any rate um thanks for joining us here on duncan and Bo uh come correct we're about to as, as you know launch into uh, a marathon of uh slasher stuff so this is as happy as you'll see us uh, until <laughs> for, we're done for, for eight episodes <laughs> yeah exactly right maybe fewer than that if we're just like we gotta fucking get done with this let's just do yeah. two episodes and finish we it. might we may have to do it may have to do it yeah you never know you never, never know. know uh well until then the only thing left to say is uh to tell my good friend duncan say good night duncan tell my good friend duncan say good night duncan no duran duran what?